What's up, Wisconsin? Back in the Inside Wisconsin studios, Trevor and John J.A. Today, we are Marquette. Look at there that. you go. I've got my old school uh, Marquette. Finally, something on this program I know a little something about. Yeah, you do. Jeez. Finally, there's something in my wheelhouse that we can talk about. Well, I shouldn't. I don't know. Is it in your wheelhouse if you can talk about things from 1977? Or should yeah, my wheelhouse be 2023? Nope, it's not my pre okay. pre eighty three is not my wheelhouse. This we have established, but today a this little bit in my big. wheelhouse. Super conversation with head coach of Marquette men's basketball, Shaka Smart. Uh, the guy has dialed in, and we've been chasing him. No joke, since he got the job in twenty twenty one when we launched this thing. And uh, listen, I will try to keep this about him and his team, and not bog him down by asking him about Bo Ellis and Jerome Whitehead and Butch Lee. And, and, you know, Bernard Toon and who else was on the 77 championship? Uh, Jimmy Boylan was the other starter for that. You've seen Boylan. He's coached with the Bucks, uh, or, well, he was a Bucks coach. He was uh, with the Bulls most recently, those guys. So I'll try not to. You know, Doc Rivers. Do you remember Sam Wortham, Sam the Sham? Yeah. I, let, why don't we just talk to Coach? How about that instead of making me feel dumb? Okay. <laughs> coach, shock is smart with Marquette. Here we go. Inside Wisconsin is brought to you by American Family Insurance. Aaron's Company, Blaine's Farm and Fleet, Capital Credit Union, Festival Foods, Quick Trip, Miller Lite, North Star Mohican Casino Resort, Prevea Health, and the University of Wisconsin Platteville. Hey, remember to subscribe on YouTube, leave a review, smash the like button, just get with us. Shaka Smart, the head coach of Marquette Golden Eagles basketball, on today on Inside Wisconsin. Coach, good to see you. Thanks for being here. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Listen, it's a good time to have you. Like, we're halfway through the conference season, two-thirds through the season itself. Uh, the record looks good. You're great in the conference. How, how do you characterize where the ball club is right now? Getting ready for practice today. You know, we, we <laughs> try to be in the moment as much as we can. You know, it's interesting in sports, as you know. Um, everybody tries to get you to focus on the past or the future. But uh, the reality for us is we haven't played since Saturday. Um, and so now, you know, it's, it's really important that we do a great job preparing and being at our best going into our next game at DePaul. Yeah, that seems to be going well so far this season, right? And it's interesting from the past, when you got hired in 2021, the first thing I thought of, and I mentioned it to John, was like, oh, he's home. That's cool. <laughs> so take us back to that for a second. What did it feel like to, to come home to Wisconsin? It was great. It's great being close to my mom. That's for sure. She still lives in the Madison area. Um, I went to high school at Oregon High School in the Madison area. Uh, still have, you know, a lot of friends there. My uncle, who I'm really close with, lives there. So it's nice to be near them. But even more importantly, uh, my family really, really enjoys this community. Um, Marquette's been great. You know, just an unbelievable group of, of people surrounding, you know, a great institution. And uh, a lot of people that are crazy about basketball, so that's cool too. I want to know if your mom's like like my mom because you're in a nomadic profession. And every time I told my mom I had a new job and it seemed to be farther away from home, she thought I disliked her or something. And you've been everywhere from you know Ohio to Florida and Clemson and Tech. Like at any point, did your mom go? Are you ever going to come home, son? Did, like, do you get that too? Well, I don't think she thought I was ever going to come home, so she didn't even bring it up. You know, I was one of those guys when I was in high school, I wanted to get as far away as I could get. Uh, so I, I don't know that she ever thought I would come back home. One of the things I've learned over the years uh, is that wherever you go, there are good people. Wherever you go, you you know, if you look hard enough, you could probably find, you know, some not so good people. Uh, you know, there are regional differences. But, you know, I, I have always had an appreciation for the Midwest and some of the values here and, uh, you know, just love being close to my mom. That's a, that's a big positive, mm -hmm. particularly for my daughter. John and I were talking before you jumped on, Coach, that it's Oregon, right? Not Oregon, Oregon, <laughs> right? It's Oregon High School. But that's closer to Madison, right? And I grew up in Johnson Creek, not Johnson Creek, Johnson Creek. And I... What? Yeah, I know. It's just, it's a thing. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's Crick. We call it Crick. Yeah, now you know. So 
I was sharing with John that I rarely got into the Milwaukee market as a kid, but I did get into Madison. So as you grew up in Wisconsin, how did you balance following basketball in the state? Well, we lived 10 minutes from the UW campus. So um, honestly, you know, that, that was the main uh, large institution that, you know, that I followed in all different sports. Um, now, when I was a kid, uh, UW was, wasn't so good in, in football or basketball. Um, and then when I was in high school, uh, both in both sports, uh, the Badgers started to get really, really good. That was when Barry Alvarez came to Wisconsin and then Stu Jackson came mm -hmm. and I believe he took the Badgers to the first NCAA tournament since like the 1940s. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, when you're a kid, you kind of are attracted to the best team. So I, I remember being in junior high school and I was more of a Michigan fan, you know, <laughs> because they, <laughs> they had, you know, uh, great players and great teams. And I, I love Bobby Knight's teams, but, I think just growing up in the in the uh, footprint of the Big Ten, you know, you, you follow a lot of those teams. And then I started following Marquette, you know, as soon as I, I kind of realized that, hey, they got big time basketball over there, too. Um, never got a chance to go see Marquette in, in person as a kid, but um, definitely remember some of those teams. So if I match up the rosters in your age, so that when you're junior high or high school, right, like Michael Finley comes along. He must have been a revelation, right? Because we didn't have anybody like that at the university, and he was phenomenal. Yep. yep. So I went to Midnight Madness. I believe it was Michael Finley's freshman year. Um, so I would have been, I don't know, a sophomore in high school or something like that. And at that time – uh, University of Wisconsin had Michael Finley. Uh, they had Tracy Webster was the best player. Mm -hmm. I, I love Tracy Webster. And, you know, a good group. And Steve Yoder was the coach. And then I think it was the next year. Uh, I think I'm getting my, my years right. Um, there was a coaching change and Stu Jackson came in. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you guys know, but Stu Jackson currently – He's held like every position in basketball, uh, including yeah. NBA head coach and president of an NBA team. But he currently is the deputy commissioner of our conference, the Big East. Wow. Um, so anyway, he comes in and, you know, it, it was it was my sophomore year he came in because, um, you know, a group of us at Oregon High School started a Black History Month celebration. And I wrote Stu Jackson a letter and I said, hey, would you come and be our keynote speaker? And at that time, as a sophomore in high school, I didn't realize the demands on you know, a <laughs> head coach at that level. Um, but it tells you what type of guy he is. Not only did he reply to the letter, he came to our school and spoke. Mm. And so uh, that made me uh, definitely a fan of his teams. And then, you know, Rashard Griffith, you guys remember yeah. that name? Oh, he yeah. came in. Uh, with that great recruiting class the next year. And they broke through and went to the NCAA tournament. The back, didn't the Bucks draft Rashard Griffith? I don't know if like, they did or not. That I don't know. Sees. Yeah. I will tell you this, Trev. You know who they lost to that first year when they came back? They won their first round game. You know who they lost to in the second round? Probably Missouri. Lost to Missouri. That's all yep. right. That's John's okay. Modern. These things happen. Hey, you talk about the Big East – uh, and I'm here in Connecticut, so I see the con and, and Coach Hurley's team and, and, and have seen them for 20-some-odd years now. Uh, give me the advantage, because you've been at VCU, which was sort of basketball-centric, Texas, which Big 12 is football country. What's it like to be and the advantages of being in the Big East in what is a basketball-dominant conference? It's a really special feeling. Um, now, the Big 12 – basketball wise is as good Ooh, as it gets smoke um, and, and, and so it, those schools all have football and and some of them are you know certainly football dominated schools but from the standpoint of basketball competitively it's it's top shelf i would put the big east you know right there probably right after um the the, the big 12 the thing that's awesome john about the big east and it's hard to really 
qualify or quantify this is because we don't have football or big time football at the schools in the big East, there's just something really, really important and meaningful about every one of these games. So when you go on the road and you're playing at Seton mm -hmm. hall or at Providence or at Villanova, you can feel it. You can feel mm -hmm. that it really, really means something. Not that it doesn't at other places, but I think because we don't have football, it's, it's kind of our thing. And I know at Marquette, one thing I really, really appreciate is every year the incoming class of freshmen, uh, I get a chance to participate in one of the orientations where they come on campus with their parents and learn about Marquette. And then I get a chance to participate in the freshman move in when they're moving into the dorms. And what's really cool about it is they're already talking about, hey, I can't wait till the first game. And so, again, that's that's just unique being at a, a basketball centric mm -hmm. place. And the five serve is quite the place to play. <laughs> I mean, like in, re in comparison to where you've been 2021, you get here and the brand spanking new Pfizer forum is your home. How's that? Awesome. You know, kill it, right? couldn't really uh, ask for a better home floor. Uh, you know, we were really, really grateful, uh, you know, to have the partnership with the Bucks. It's, it's humbling, really, you know, because the best player, arguably the best player in the, on the planet uh, plays in our arena. And sometimes, like, we'll have a game coming up in a couple Saturdays where we play at 1 o'clock and then a matter of hours later, um, Giannis and his teammates play. And so it's, you know, really cool. And for a guy, you know, that played division three basketball to be able to, you know, be in a venue like that is pretty cool. How'd you end up in division three Kenyon college? Cause if you can't be D one and there's plenty of places to play in Wisconsin D one, but there's also the, the Platteville's of the world and, and stout and river falls and all these other places. How is it you decided? I know you said you want to get a far away from home. Why was it that Kenyon college, and leaving the state was was for you at that time. That's a long story, John. I'll, I'll give you the short version. OK. Um, the coach, you know, I, I was like a lot of our guys, um, even though I wasn't as good of a player as they are. Uh, I, I chose Kenyon and I chose the school I went to because of the basketball program, because of the basketball coach. And I know that mm -hmm. sounds funny, you know, when you're talking about Division three or a level where you don't have athletic scholarships, but I can promise you, I was about as basketball crazy as it gets. And I went out and visited a few Ivy league schools. I was fortunate enough to, to get into those schools and be, I guess, lightly recruited by them to play. Uh, but honestly, I was really intimidated when I went on those campuses. It was like <laughs> for a young kid from the Midwest who hadn't really been exposed to a whole lot. It, it just seemed a little, mm -hmm overwhelming so I, I i chose to go to kenyon and um one of the tough things was the coach that i went to play for left after my freshman year and that was one of the hardest days of my life but i still had a great experience so that's what i was going to follow up with this coach he's gone everywhere you go whenever you take a new job as a head coach any of these places all those kids on that roster you're not the guy that got them there so tell me how you go about using that situation you had to, I don't know if re-recruit those kids is the right word, but to go in and say, hey, we're, we're wanted and, and you're here. And, you know, how do you, how does that experience inform what you do now when you take over new teams? Well, it absolutely informs it because, you know, first of all, I have an empathy for what they're going through. Uh, when I took over the job at VCU, I was replacing a highly, highly successful coach in Anthony Grant. He's, he's currently the head coach at Dayton. And, I'll tell you, like in our early workouts in the spring, those guys were like sabotaging workouts because they were so <laughs> angry that there had been a coaching change and they were taking it out on me. So I, I, I learned early on that, you know, don't necessarily take it personally, but, you know, guys are not going to be particularly happy about the change that occurred. Um, and then, you know, you just try to build relationships. It takes time. Uh, there, there's no such thing as a, microwave relationship in, in my opinion uh, that's not that's why I'm not a big transfer portal guy um, because it's just it's impossible to mm -hmm. 
you know, build a meaningful relationship over the span of a couple of weeks. Uh, so it becomes way more transactional. Um, you know, I understand certainly why a lot of programs take transfers and, you know, there's, there's a lot of merit probably behind it. But, uh, yeah, just try to build relationships, John, and, and get guys mm -hmm. to understand that, hey, we're in the same place now together and we want the same things. And if you give me a chance, I think I can really help you grow and improve. By the way, Anthony Grant is the tip of the iceberg at VCU. And, and now Trevor and I have this thing where he doesn't know what happens before 1983. But my goodness, Sonny Smith and Benny Dees. And I worked in Tulsa when J.D. Barnett was the coach, and he had an assistant at VCU named Tubby Smith. Like, until I got to know J.D., I had no idea. But that play, you're a cradle of coaches when you go to get that job. Hey, John, that's impressive, man. How many, guys, how many national guys could rattle off a list of coaches like that at, at, a, at a school, an Atlantic 10 school in Richmond, Virginia? I got to give you because I knew JD, But that's because I met J.D. Barnett. I, co I covered J.D. for umpteen years. And he's like, listen, I wasn't the only guy that could coach there. And so I kind of always had, had a bit of an eye on it, like I said. And then Tubby Smith came and coached at Tulsa as well. And he was on J.D.'s bench. So some of these things, you know. I tell I tell Trevor all the time they don't give this job just to you know dudes walking <laughs> off the street. I've tried to pay attention. <laughs> yeah. No, when I got there, uh, the, the, the secretary's name was Diane Long, and uh, you know somebody gave me a really bad piece of advice. They said fire the secretary, and they didn't. They weren't talking oh. about her specifically. They were just saying, hey, when you take over a new job, you've got to get rid of anyone that was there, and that was completely wrong. Because Diane Long had been the secretary for some of those guys that you named, including J.D., and I was her seventh head coach. So I was the seventh head coach that she had worked for. She used to call me lucky number seven. Uh, but I got, I got plenty of uh, awesome stories about Sonny, about J.D. Uh, there, was a, there was a great group of, of coaches that, that, that uh, went through VCU, and I was fortunate to sit in the same seat that they did. Yeah, for guy. sure. We're going to talk about some things before 1983. That's happening. 100% chance that's happening. Yeah. I know I wasn't around for that, but I've done a little reading. Um, I'm at least educated. All right, we're back in a bit. We want to make sure we respect Coach's time. Segment two in a second. We're Inside Wisconsin with Coach Shaka Smart. Inside Wisconsin is brought to you by American Family Insurance, Aaron's Company, Blaine's Farm and Fleet, Capital Credit Union, Festival Foods, Quick Trip, Miller Lite, North Star Mohican Casino Resort, Provea Health, and the University of wisconsin Platteville. Hey, remember to subscribe on YouTube, leave a review, smash the like button, just get with us. J.A., nearly every year we throw a big game party. And I can't say, we're not allowed to say the words, but the, the big game, game is... The what right. game? The large game. The large game. Yeah, the, the, the largest game. of... Yeah, the, the games. That's, game. Yeah, that, that with the things. Um, we throw a party for that, typically. Invite a bunch of friends over, and it's a spread. We go to Festival Foods, and we put out the spread. You and I have talked yep. a lot about this a lot, but if you could pick, like, one thing that you had to have in your spread for the big game, what would it be? Wow. Uh, I am I am sort of, uh, as you know, I'm a very much a traditionalist, mm -hmm. but I would, I would like me, I would love me a wing, some sort of a yeah. chicken wing, right? I'm down with that. And I don't mind is where I like a little hot, uh, like a hot dog, but it seems to be more of a um, party thing is if you make the small, you know, the, the little smoky and the crescent roll and the pigs in yeah. a blanket. And I, I think if you kind of compared the number of those I ate to an actual hot dog, it'd be like, wow, you just ate 16 hot dogs. Cause you just, you eat them kind of like they're M&Ms, right? You just yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> so those two things I would really, if I, if, if I had those two things, um, I, I, I could go, I could go deep into the fourth quarter before I bitch. <laughs> That's funny. Little smokies. Yeah. The little weenies, little smokies, little wrapped in a little bread, some wings. That's how you go about the big game. I guarantee you all those things are available at festival foods over 40, 40 locations. I believe is the number here in the state of Wisconsin. It doesn't matter where you live or where you're listening to inside Wisconsin, go to your local festival foods, bulk up for the big game and have a night with wings and friends and little smokies and maybe a little stadium sauce if they sell that and that to the little smokies what do you think 
Sure. Uh, yeah, you could do that. Uh, yeah, that's the, barbecue. That's, I don't know that there's anything that that's not good on, right? You could put it on, put it on your ice cream sundae in, in lieu of chocolate sauce. No way. They serve. They they have the sports service sauce, the secret stadium sauce at Festival Foods. Done. We have it covered. We are back in between segments with the head coach of Marquette Men's Basketball, Coach Shaka Smart. Time for another top five list today. Again, presented by the University of Wisconsin Platteville. Make a smart investment and choose from 50 academic programs, including criminal justice, forensics, investigation, and education. UW Platteville's affordable cost means you'll graduate with less student debt and more opportunity. Find out more at uwplat.edu. Student debt, none of it. Try not to have any of it. Go to Platte. Right. All right. So, Marquette basketball, I have admitted that this is not my strongest suit. I didn't spend a lot of time following Marquette as a kid, but you did. Yep. And so there is a memorable season, 1977, Al McGuire, which, by the way, you tipped me off that today, ironically, as we tape this, is the how many year unfortunate anniversary of his passing? Uh, I want to say the 22nd. I believe he died wow. in 2001 on January 26th. And as we tape this episode, it's January uh, 26th. So... Uh, yeah, that was, uh, I, I don't know how many times I've said it on this show before. College basketball to me growing up as a kid was Marquette. And yeah. they had, you know, they were, they were the team. They were always highly ranked. They were, uh, you know, Al famously once snubbed the NCAA to go to the NIT because it used to have, the NT, NIT used to have more grandeur than the NCAA tournament. He was really? a New York guy. He wanted to bring, oh yeah, yeah, he wanted to go back and bring his teams to New York City. So he has a great NIT history as well as the NCAA history uh, by the way something criminal you talk about criminal justice was when marquette beat missouri in the 2003 ncaa tournament and they went to the final four um they played missouri in the in the second round the game went to overtime and they didn't miss a shot and Dwayne wade will never let you forget it scored 21 points and my boy d wade does not ever let me forget it <laughs> jerk but we're going to talk about 1977 so the top five is simply the five games they won so this is this is a top five. It's more of a review top five for people that may not know, but you should know. These are things you should you should have. I like it. You know, in your heart. So uh, this is how long ago it was in the round of thirty two. Oh, it wasn't even sixty four. They no back then no, and you had first round buys, and it was all very well, complicated. What is it now a hundred sixty eight? Dumb. By the way, I think I'm the guy that brought came up with first four, and then somebody NCAA stole it on me. Anyway. What? So round of 32, they beat a really good ranked Cincinnati team uh, in the first round, 66-51. That was a team they had beat during the regular season as well. Cincinnati, of course, famous for their most famous basketball player was? I'm going to know the name, 100%. Uh, Oscar Robertson. Yep. Later no. uh, helped lead the Bucks with Lou Alcindor, Bucks. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar yep. to their first time. Uh, then the Sweet 16, they beat Kansas State, 67-66. And back then, Kansas State was, I mean, they were always unbelievable. I'm trying to think. That was probably Jack Hartman's coach in that team. Do you hate know. them as much as you hate the other one? Nope. Oh. No ill will whatsoever. Nope. Okay. Totally fine with the guys in the Little Apple. Uh, the Elite Eight, they beat Wake Forest. 82-68, Wake Forest had just beaten Arkansas, a really good uh, uh, team coached by Eddie Sutton back then. So those I kind of uh, – I'm not familiar with. Those are to like you and I. Those are just games. And then they go to the Final Four in Atlanta, and those games I remember distinctly. And so in the, in the national semifinal, which, by the way, was played like in the middle of the Saturday afternoon, like 1 o'clock. It wasn't this giant was. event. Uh, they beat Charlotte 51-49, and they win it. Uh, almost a length of the court pass, and Jerome Whitehead, little pump fake, puts it in, win it. Wow. Unbelievable play. Totally exciting. Goes down to the end. It probably would have been an overtime, but in this case, Jerome Whitehead, who played in the, who played in the league for a long time. Um, uh, Sounds like you were, you were talking about NC State and mm -hmm. Jimmy V. Like, no. Same thing almost? Uh, no, because that was – no, that was a – the the Jimmy V shot was a was a a, a three point miss that Low Charles put in. Oh, okay, that's Darren all I can picture is somebody catching it and putting it back in. Yeah, yeah. Darren Wittenberg misses the three, but it is similar like that. And then he gets this is a length of the court pass that they do Got that. It. And then Noted. in the final four, they beat North Carolina, who had the championship. Oh, yeah, 
beat North Carolina in the championship game, who had Phil Ford and had Walter Davis and Michael Corrin, I think, was on that team. These guys were beasts. Um, and they kind of had him. And back then, they didn't have a shot clock. So hmm. um, North Carolina and Dean Smith, very famous for their four corners, right? They just spread it out and just throw it around until he came out and guard him and forced him to play some. And Al McGuire, uh, I can still hear him talking about that game. He said they what they really did is they hurt themselves – and he said, I can still hear him saying, they dried their sweat. So they were going, and now all of a sudden they stood around and threw it around. They dried their sweat, and they got kind of cold, and, and Marquette was able to, to plow through them. And they win that 67-59. And then that in the ultimate, uh, what would Al say, treetops and seashells and balloons, his last game. That was it. Wins the wow. game. Retired. Off into the sunset. I'll see you in the broadcast with Billy Packer and Dick Enberg where Shaka said made him unbelievably smart. But yeah, so their tar- tournament run and Shaka at VCU when they had to go 68 would have had to win seven games. Now you have to win six. They had to win five. Cincinnati, K-State, Wake Forest, UNC, Charlotte, now to Charlotte, and North Carolina. So they lost in 74 to Michael Th- uh, to David Thompson, NC State. They win a couple years later uh, against North Carolina, the other school out of the ACC. The- the buzzer sounds and Dick Lining Kugel marches to the lake. Off he goes. Off. Oh, and then turns around and comes back because they didn't know what the hell they were going to do. And then went down. to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> Great story. Oh, man. All right. There it is. Today's top five list the five teams that Marquette in 1977 beat to win it all. Uh, this team has a chance. Back to Coach Smart. We are back inside Wisconsin. Trevor, John, and Marquette's head coach, Shaka Smart. Shaka, okay, so this whole idea of the history of Marquette, I actually texted my high school coach today, who is, we are Marquette crazy. Like, he's at every game. He's constantly posting about it. His name is Tim Wagner. And I said, hey, Wags, tell me what I need to know, man. We are Marquette. I see it all the time. And he said, I actually refed a game that Shaka played in back in Oregon and then obviously go to the games. He was a class act then. He was a class act now. How do you talk about not only the history of Marquette in the state, but just your familiar familiarity with it as you're the head coach now with recruits? I love it. I love history. I love learning. And the stories about all the individuals that, that made all that winning occur here are the best part. So, um, you know, 1977 happens to be the year that I was born. Uh, it's also the year Marquette won the national championship. I obviously don't remember that national championship, but I do remember probably being about 12, you know, 13, 14 years old and um, seeing Al McGuire doing games on TV and, mm-hmm. and just learning about him and his coaching style and his players. And since then, I'm, I've probably heard a hundred different Al McGuire stories and it's hard to really say which one is the best story because I don't know if there's ever been a coach who had more personality and more swagger to them. And then the guys that played for Al kind of followed suit. They all had this incredible way about them as well. Yeah. He's almost mythic, right? You have coaches that are, are, are big deals, but he's almost mythic. And, and sometimes you're like, is that true? Or is that now fantasy? Or is, are people making that because he was remarkable. And you talk about what you remembered when you were 12 or 13. And I always say those are your strongest sports memories. Honestly, I'm not sure who you beat last week, but I can name the starting five of that team because I was 12. And those were, you know, that was basketball to me in Wisconsin when I was a kid. How do you meld that? Because you've got this great tradition. I saw you just had the 2003 Final Four team back. Meld that tradition with the culture you want to instill uh, in the program now that it's yours. And how do I how do I bridge that so I get the best of all of that? It's a great question, John. And I think that at most programs, uh, it, it becomes very very difficult to create and maintain connection with former players. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons behind that, but it really doesn't matter what the reasons are. It's our job to try to counteract those reasons. Mm-hmm. And and I think. Uh, it's, you know, just little things like reaching out, um, making people know that they're always welcome at practice, at games, at away games. We played in St. John at St. John's in New York 
a few weeks ago and Butch Lee lives up in that area. Mm. And listen, I don't know if I've ever met someone that, so Butch would probably be in his sixties that has the swagger. I mean, when he walks in the room, it's like he might as well be an NBA all-star right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the way that he carries himself. And so, you know, we've had him speak to the guys a few times. We honored him in a game last year. One of the things that, that we chose to do is every year we're honoring a different uh, championship or, or high achieving team from Marquette basketball's past. So as you mentioned, this year was the 2003 uh, Final Four team. Next year is actually the 50th anniversary of the 1974 Final mm -hmm. Four team. I'll tell you a great story uh, from, from that team. Bo Ellis was a freshman on that team. And just to show you how good of a player he was, he played every minute of the national championship game against NC State mm -hmm. until he fouled out with about 45 seconds left. And so, I mean, you got to be a, a, a damn good player to be on a national championship uh, caliber team and play every second of the game until you foul out. So after the game, you know, they stuck a microphone in his face and he's a freshman, he's 18 years old. And he had a very, very profound statement. And the statement is actually memorialized in this facility, the Al McGuire Center. He said, we'll be back. He said, it won't be here. It'll be another time. It'll be another place. But we'll be back and we're going to win this thing. And, of course, his senior year, 1977, they were back. Mm -hmm. And they got to the national championship game. And this time they're playing North Carolina and Dean Smith and Butch Lee and Bo Ellis and the rest of the crew brought home the national championship. Do your, do your guys have the swagger to get a team picture in tuxedos and in, in a, like in a 1934 Packard convertible, which is one of the greatest Man. pictures in college basketball history? Yeah. I mean, those guys, the pictures of those guys <laughs> are just <laughs> like, wow. Uh, I, I, I'll show you. And I can send this one to you if you want. This, this is one that you probably haven't seen. There's a picture of Butch Lee – Bo Ellis and Lloyd Walton, who's another mm -hmm. great player from those teams. And they're on the bench and it's in Madison Square Garden. And there's 14 minutes left in the game. And they're up by 35 points. And the backstory is they, pl they were playing Fordham. The coach from Fordham had, had come on a, like a national media outlet and criticized Al McGuire's schedule. As you know, at that time, you know, Marquette was independent. So the schedule mm -hmm. was completely, you know, determined by, you know, by the coach. And, and so this coach at Fordham had been critical of Marquette's scheduling. And so Al said, OK, we're coming to the garden to play you. And they just beat the mess out of him. But the, <laughs> in this picture, John, you would love this picture because the look on these guys face is a mixture of arrogance in a good way good arrogance um boredom it's like <laughs> and they're signing these autographs for these kids in the garden with 14 minutes left in the game up 35 points and it's just Jeez. it's awesome yeah well, definitely send that our way yeah <laughs> that was, those were al's guys though new york right dean memager was a new york guy butch was a new york guy he always said he went and found his guy his point guards there uh so that team you talked about two final four themes uh, from marquette you, you have been to a Final Four. I want to know how the appreciation changes as you get farther away from it of how hard that is to get to. You think, oh, you got to win a couple, four games. How tough can that be? You know, um, as, as you get farther away from the one you went to and as you continue to try to go to the next one, what's your appreciation for the accomplishment of that team and actually getting to a Final Four? Well, I would say in general, as I get older, my appreciation goes up for everything uh, <laughs> and, and, and just the gratitude for every opportunity that we have. Um, but absolutely, John, um, that was the first year that I coached as a head coach in the NCAA tournament. And so we actually were picked in the final four, or excuse me, the first four. So we were one of the last teams mm -hmm. in and we won five games and all of them, but one, we won convincingly by double figures. 
um, and then lost in the semifinals. And so absolutely after that, I think probably not a full appreciation of how hard that really is. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, since then there's certainly been some humbling <laughs> games and some tough, tough, you know, defeats. And I think the biggest thing is just recognizing that in order to do something that special, you have to be so connected and, and have such good relationships in that moment. You know, mm -hmm. Phil Jackson once said teammate, uh, teamwork is an ephemeral thing. It's as ethereal as love disappearing with the latest insult. <laughs> and he was talking about Kobe and Shaq and the Lakers. And um, wow, that's a mouthful. But that mm -hmm. applies to anyone that makes the Final Four. Yeah, it's hard. And listen, I love you forever because you beat Kansas, which is a Missouri guy makes my heart just swell <laughs> when, when you when you do that. But if people you gotta give, feel good about you got to feel good about D Gates and, and the job he's doing in Missouri. Right now, I'm terrified that Notre Dame's going to hire him, so I can't go there right now. Okay, this is this is too hard. I hope he's going to be there. I've, <laughs> I've done my best, uh, you know, uh, when it comes through. But but I, I say this, and this is the only time I'll say something nice about Kansas because people are always like Kansas. They should have gone to a billion Final Fours, and I know I've known Bill since he was an assistant with Leonard Hamilton. And you go like, yeah, he's got great teams. That's how hard it is. Right. Like he's got great teams every year and he's made it, what, four times, which is amazing. But it's really hard to do. So well, um, Bill Self. I was in the league with Bill Self for six years. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about I, I would say, in my opinion, one of the top two or three coaches in the last 40 years in college basketball, just from the standpoint of everything that goes into coaching and what he does not get enough credit for is the way that he's able to take guys out of high school that for whatever reason might be, you know, missing something that would make them, you know, just the number one player in the country. And he's able to help them create that something. Uh, so, you know, since you brought him up, I I, I want to compliment him because he's he's well. Amazing. Just so you know, that'll get cut from this show because I won't allow that. And I think he's a, <laughs> listen. He what's worse is he's the nicest human being in the world uh, too, right? So he's it's despicable, yes. but that'll never make the the later day. Before we go uh, to a break here, I want to talk about the other part. It, you talk about your team and your roster, but like it's a team, and you and your wife have really it, it ingratiated yourself in the community. Uh, I love her because she loves books. So I'm all in on anybody that's in on books like that. But talk about sort of what you guys have tried to do and bring to the university and bring to the community um, through foundations, through her work and literacy and those kind of things. Because my goodness, how admirable is that beyond uh, the whole shut up and dribble thing, which is, you know, uh, another story. But this is like here are the layers that basketball coaches do so much good other than drawing up X's and O's out of timeouts. Well, I mean, we learned a long time ago that the the platform that you have as a as a basketball coach and and the, you know basketball coach's family is one that can have uh, a far greater impact than just winning a game or, or winning games. So, first of all, my wife is um, about as intelligent as they come. Harvard grad, Northwestern grad, uh, just published her first book. Uh, last year and very, very humbling anytime we're both reading the same thing because she reads about 10 times faster than me. <laughs> and so she is absolutely a, a literacy advocate. She's an expert on actually the process of how kids learn to read. And, you know, she's always had a passion for childhood literacy. We also have a passion for helping people that uh, maybe are less fortunate than certain others. Um, and, you know, in, in, in a lot of the, the cases that, that we've worked on, you know, people from the African-American community, because that's the community that, that, that we're a part of. Um, and so my wife's done a lot of great work. You know, we've tried to make sure wherever we are, whether it's Richmond, Virginia, Austin, Texas, or now in Milwaukee, that, you know, we try to help in the community. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of great things already being done here. So I think sometimes when you're in the, the role that I'm in, one of the best things you can do is 
just try to amplify some of the good things that are already happening through the platform that we have. Mm-hmm. Kind of feel like Joe Buck over here. I got the first question, and then SVP and Troy just <laughs> talked the rest of that. I swear I'm going to ask you another question in the next segment. I promise. All right, we're going to wrap it up with the coach in just a second. Inside Wisconsin. Inside Wisconsin is brought to you by American Family Insurance, Aaron's Company, Blaine's Farm and Fleet, Capital Credit Union, Festival Foods, Quick Trip, Miller Lite, North Star Mohican Casino Resort, Prevea Health, and the University of Wisconsin Platteville. Hey, remember to subscribe on YouTube, leave a review, smash the like button, just get with us. So this shouldn't surprise you. I don't know where Marquette was playing in 1977 when they won the national championship. Was it the Bradley Center? Was that around or was it the arena? The Mecca. The Mecca. Yeah, yeah, the Mecca Arena. They played the at Mecca, the-, the Mecca, the Bradley Center, and then Fiserv. And yes, I think of like County Stadium, Miller Park, now AmFam Field. Uh, lots of friends, lots of opportunities to drink Miller Lite. All the that time back in the day, I, I, I do they they don't tailgate for basketball games, right? I don't think quite like uh, the traditional that we think of. No, you just head no. over to what's that bar, Major Ripley's. You ever been there? I don't know that I have. Feel like it's and I don't know that. And right, the Bradley Center is no longer there, but I think the Mecca is. Is that right? Oh yeah, that's UW Panther Arena now. Yeah, right. Um, The Mecca, best floor and the best floor in all of of uh, basketball. And I remember when the NCAA tournament over the years has played quite a few times there in Milwaukee. I feel like the Badgers were now they played at the Bradley Center a lot. Yeah, Mm -hmm. they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, didn't the, ba- didn't the Badgers, the Badgers uh, hockey team won a national championship in the Bradley Center, I believe. I didn't know. Their last one, backstopped by Brian Elliott, 2-1 overtime against <laughs> BU or BC, one of the two. How? How do you do that? Like, is it? Dude, just, that was in your come- lifetime. Shut up. That was in the last 15 years. But does you it come in that. one time and then it goes away? Or, I mean, like, you only need to hear it once because that, like, the amount of things that live in. All right. A lot of friends, a lot of opportunities to have Miller Lights. Talk about That's drinking I- beer. Can we? That's what I was going for. Just have go. a Miller Lite. And maybe that's why I don't remember a lot. Of, <laughs> anyway, uh, when you're with friends, yes. have a Miller Lite. It just gets Perfect. better, specifically when it's basketball season, right? It's yep. winter time. There's a lot of things that you can't do outside. So sit inside, watch some hoops, have a Miller Lite, and just life will just be better. Miller Lite, great taste, 96 calories. Go to MillerLite.com slash inside Wisconsin to find delivery options near you. Or you can pick up some Miller Lite pretty much anywhere they sell beer. It's Miller time. John, Mm -hmm. was it the floral shop last time? Were you in there for like an early Valentine's Day gift or something? Bakery. It was the bakery. Yeah, yeah, it was the bakery. Probably the bakery. Yeah. This no. This time I. This time I wasn't. I was at. uh, uh, I was at the. uh, I guess I call it the White Store. I don't want to use the specific name, but you know where you buy maybe betting stuff or bath stuff or beyond uh, stuff like uh, that. <laughs> what were you doing there? I don't want to know. <laughs> Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 96 calories and 3.2 carbs per 12 ounces. Have a Miller Lite. Life is better. We're back inside Wisconsin with Coach Trevor and John. Time for the lightning round. I, I do get a question or two real quick. Number one, Coach, you wouldn't be able to tell now, but I played a little basketball myself. I'm six foot eight. I played college at 235, and your system is called Havoc. Yes? There's nothing about Havoc that a really big guy enjoys. So <laughs> how's that conversation with your big men? Yeah, we play Havoc here. How about we play – that sounds scary. Yeah? We actually don't really use that moniker anymore. Um, oh, okay. I sure. guess in the media it's kind of stuck to me a little bit, which is fine. But the way we play, actually, you would love – the way we play because our bigs handle the ball more than anyone in the country at that size. Hmm. We actually have a kid on our team, Oso Igadaro, who's six foot ten, and he's like a point forward. I mean, we set pick and rolls for him. He brings the ball up to court. Uh, he initiates offense. We play through him. He's what we call a trigger man. So you would fit right in, man. If you can find any more eligibility, then uh, maybe we'll <laughs> sign you up. I've got a few, and you're going to want to have me lose like 60 pounds because I'm a little bit away from 235 these days. Uh, all right, hey, one more quick question, then John's lighting around. Super fun. John mentioned books. Look at that stack of books behind you. What's your favorite book in that stack? Uh, you know what's funny is this stack of books behind me is actually a bunch of books I've not read. 
Oh. Uh, because what happens is a lot of people give me books because they know I, I like to read <laughs> and I get books at a faster rate than I can necessarily <laughs> read books. So um, if you're asking me for my favorite book of all time, yeah. that would be really, really hard. I probably would say uh, The Untethered Soul. Michael Smith read. is the author. I'll write okay. that down. Hi, Jay, you're up. If I could turn my thing, you'd, I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. You see this stack of books and people go, wow, you must be a voracious reader. I'm like, no, I'm actually, if I was a voracious reader, that stack wouldn't look like that. It would be... <laughs> It would only be one book there and there'd be the rest of them in the red shelf. Instead, the ones on the left are like, I've got a bunch of them. To, right now, I'm doing one on the on the Brooklyn Bridge, which is fascinating because the guy who did the Brooklyn Bridge, right, had a stroke midway through. And he wow. completed the bridge by literally just tapping instructions huh. to his wife on her hand. Very cool. I've, I've, I've ran across that bri bi bridge several times, so I'm glad you told me that. There you go. Yeah, I, I've run. A, well, no, not the Brooklyn Bridge. I'm trying to think of the ones you go across in the marathon. Um, I've run across those, but only once. All right, here we go. I want to know who is the best athlete in your neighborhood that wasn't you? Well, I had a teammate. You're saying as a kid, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had a teammate named Will Smith. Uh, same name as the actor. And right. we were the backcourt on our team at Oregon High School. And he was about five foot nine. But the out of bounds play, if we ever were having trouble getting it in, was just throw the ball up really, really high, and then he would go get it. He he could really jump. Up. Okay, Will Smith, we love that. Uh, did you have the key to your high school gym? Oh, I can tell you some great stories about that one. <laughs> uh, I did not have the key. My high school coach. I'm glad you asked because I wanted to bring him up. His name's Kevin Bavery. He's now coaching at Middleton High School, which is also, you know, just outside of Madison. Um, and he he took me under his wing. Uh, he, he put his arm around me and treated me like one of his own. And I would call him. I had this thing where I love to be in the gym on Friday and Saturday nights because obviously that's a time when other people might be doing other things. Mm -hmm. And so I would call him on Fridays and Saturday nights and – uh, he would open up the gym for me. I normally didn't have a key, but he would get mm -hmm. me in the gym. But I will say this, and I, I don't know if he even knows this. If I couldn't get a hold of him, I had another way. And that was there was this gate that kind of closed off the gym. And if I could find my way in the school, which there's a couple different ways to get in the school, there was about three feet between the gate and the ceiling. So if I climbed, climbed up the gate and got over the gate, but under the ceiling, I could get in the gym. Wow. So I would do that from time to time. But I also, John, I once almost got arrested for <laughs> refusing to leave the gym. <laughs> wow. That was a great one. But I ended up leaving because that might not have been good getting arrested. <laughs> that would have been great, though. What's this man's offense? He was trying to play basketball too long that's terrible uh aaron Rodgers. we get to trade him release him or start him i love aaron Rodgers. i mean I, I, I like i think people overcomplicate things the reality is i mean he's an mvp level quarterback and so if he wants to be on the team then I, I, if i'm if i was in charge come on like i'd love to have you got a lot of people that are like ah, oh, we'll just toss away the hall of famer i'm sure there's another one around the corner uh, this is a little obscure. Who did the Milwaukee Bucks select with their sixth round pick in the 1975 draft? Oh, wow. Sixth it, round pick, 1975. Is it somebody I should know? Oh. Oliver Purnell. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I love OP. Yeah, he's another guy like a father figure to me. I knew that. You know what? You know what else? <laughs> Bill Brown, my college coach, the one I told you left. Yeah. He also was selected by the Bucks, I believe, in 1974. In so, 74, they also drafted Mike Dean, who was a predecessor of yours at Marquette right. in the coaching tree. Uh, give me the best current Marquette uniform combo, because you guys used to rule the world in this. And I know the NCAA has shrunk the creativity in it, but what's your best uniform combo? 
Well, you know, we have those old school uniforms in like a, a showcase area downstairs in, in this building, uh, but they won't let us wear them, you know, just because of the, no. the rules. I would say we have seven different uniform colors, John. Uh, I would say the best ones, you got to go with championship blue. It's that that light blue uh, that, that the uh, Golden Eagles wore or the Warriors at the time wore the day they won the mm-hmm. national championship. I'm with you. Uh, last one. If we're playing horse... What shot do you use to knock me out? I got a couple of good trick shots. I like to shoot uh, like facing away from the basket, and I turn over my head and shoot it like this. Um, and I'm pretty good at that one from about maybe 10, 12 feet. So, and I can also do it left-handed. So oh. I think I could probably get you on that one. Hey, John, you need to come. You guys need to come to Marquette, spend some time. Well, yeah. first off, I shoot left-handed, so there's, there's a, I got a chance. <laughs> You're gonna have to call offhand, otherwise I'm gonna shoot it left and you go, damn, that guy's all right. By the way, I don't. Is this a Wisconsin thing or not? Two shots on E. Was that just no. my neighborhood? We always played two shots on E. No, no, one well, and done. No, we would do more. Like you have to prove it. So if I make the shot and you miss it, then I got to make it again. I've heard of that. Wow. Wow, we, we, we yeah. weren't quite that. We weren't that cutthroat. We were just two two shots on E. We were bene- we were a benevolent group in my driveway. Yeah. Hey, before I go, can I give one other shout out? Yep, please. Uh, I just heard it's like yesterday or the day before that Jerry Pettigrew, a high school coach at Cuba City High School of sixty years of experience, my is is, is retiring this year, and he's also won over a thousand games, which at any level. Hmm. It's ridiculous. So, you know, since we're on inside Wisconsin, I wanted to give a shout out to Coach Pettigrew. Appreciate he's the that. best That's awesome. and uh, appreciate everything he's done for basketball in the state. Listen, I'll, I'll put the bow on it like this, because in watching basketball coaches, we, we write you, you've gushed about Bill Self or Coach K just retired. And we get those guys because they're at the top. The number of influential basketball coaches through the ranks, whether it's at D3, whether it is. Dave Buss, who was at, at D2 UWGB, or the guy at Southwest that was one, there just before I got there named Steve Nault, like Morgan Wooten, right? The, the, the list of basketball coaches that are influential, I think, is the largest scope of any sport you'll find. It's amazing. And, yes, and guys, the guys that get to the top of it like you are amazing, but, but the, the, the pyramid of, 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 to borrow from Wooden, the pyramid of greatness that starts at the bottom is really uh, – uh, is really astounding in the sport. Well, Coach Wooden said, they asked me why, Coach, and I reply, where else would I find such splendid company? Hmm. And that's, if you do it for that reason, then you're going to really be able to impact some people. And I couldn't agree more. There's so many great coaches, particularly in this state. So thank you guys so much for having me on. Appreciate it. This was good company, Coach. We really appreciate you coming on, man. We'll talk to you soon and have a great rest of the season. You got it. Thank you. John, I coach a seventh and eighth grade basketball team, right? Um, I did not have the appreciation for how dialed in my college or high school coach was, or seriously like coach smart is. I mean, those guys, I just can only imagine the X's and O's that run through them. That was fun. Those guys, listen, they have – I remember Digger Phelps telling me one time, like, I have 23 different out-of-bounds plays. And, you know, my smart-ass comment is always like, well, do you have just one that works? Because if you did, it seems like you'd be off the hook. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, those guys, they – and it's just – honestly, anymore, the X and the O's is this much of – this big of a job. you got to motivate kids. True. you got to make sure they go to class. you got to keep them in there. you got to deal with nil. you got to – uh, you know, there are social things that are around that you've got to deal with um, that are hard. And so they they do have to be singular. And that guy's won a bunch everywhere he's gone. You know, he was really yeah. successful at Texas. Texas always has this great thing. They get rid of a person because they're not successful enough. And then you look back at the three people he preceded, and you're like, wasn't he as success- successful as them? Now, Rick Barnes had an exceptional tenure at, True. at, at, at in Austin. But – you know, they're doing that with their football now. We got to get the next guy, the next guy. Like outside of Mac Brown, they haven't been that great. Um, but he is just he's one and he's one and he's one. And I, I enjoyed hearing him talk about the final four because when you go to the final four, 
things have gone really well, right? You, I right. mean, you might have had some scary games in there, but essentially to win those four games and get there, you've done great. Like it's been a tournament ride, like it's amazing. And it's only after you lose some that you realize how hard it is to do um, what they do. Look, look at Krzyzewski, 43 years, and he went to a lot yes. of Final Fours. But you're like, every year they go, well, they've got Final Four potential. Well, that's that's different. That was an amazing run. And hopefully he will uh, – he'll be – super successful there because listen as a state as great as it is to have the badgers be good it's better if marquette's good too and it's better if uwgb's great and you know uh and there's a there's room enough for all them to shine uh, when they come through and for somebody like me when marquette's good i'm like that's what basketball is and in his case this is great because people like me now when you're 50 when i'm 57 so people my age and above those are your donors too Right. Those are the people now that have the money. So if you can bring it back and some guy who's 65 going, oh, my gosh, that was back in the day. Now you can get the, you know, the money pours in. That's what you need to do. It is cool to see a Wisconsin kid back in Wisconsin winning basketball games for a Wisconsin team there in Milwaukee, Wisconsin with Marquette. Cool, cool. Yeah. And what a shout out, by the way, to the the coach. Right. That was I mean, just look how Mm -hmm. dialed in they even are with that. Yes. So, and by the way, do you know, do you know what Kenyon, so he played on his, the Kenyon teams he played on were not very good. They didn't win many games. They won about 25% of their game. Do you know what Kenyon college is famous for? No. In athletics, they are the premier swimming and diving program in D3. Like, remember when, when, when UCLA and John Wooden won seven in a row, whatever it was, nine out of ten, or John Wooden's success. John Wooden could only hope to be as successful as they were in swimming and diving at Kenyon. That's how great Interesting. So, wow. Yeah, I those, gonna, those, no, they got all the shine there. thought I was going to be track and field, not going to lie. Nope. Uh, all right, so I continue to be amazed, and even Coach Smart was amazed, with the knowledge that you carry in that dome and the stories that you hold so dear. So, shockingly, not shockingly, you have a Marquette story as a John Wisconsin recap today, right? Yeah, I do. And by the way, when you that's not, I think you're complimenting me because some people would I go, am. well, maybe you should broaden your horizons, Anderson. <laughs> and once <laughs> no. in a while, think about, you know, international relations or perhaps, <sighs> you know, international currency or, or, you know, global warming instead of who was the <laughs> J.D. Barnett, who I'm sure you've never heard of, but... Uh, so- was- yeah, so no. really good coach. He replaced nope. Nolan. He replaced Nolan Richardson, by the way, in Tulsa before Nolan oh, went good. over and did that. So uh, John Wisconsin, but it happened here, but it happened with the former Marquette coach, Rick Majerus. OK, so so Al McGuire, Al gave way to Hank Raymond's after uh, Hank did uh, was let go. Rick took over for a couple, three years and then went to um, Utah. Then he went to the Bucks for I think a year or two with uh, on their bench, and then went out to Utah and was okay. uber successful. Yeah, and then came out here. After after that, he had a brief stint with us, and then he went to um, St. Louis. Uh, died young, heart attack, uh, the yeah. way everybody thought he would go. Um, uh, but a uh, jovial, fun guy. Yeah, hated television because um, he couldn't speak in short sound bites. He was a great storyteller. And so I tell what people ask me all the time, Trevor, and we've done our top five, but they get, you know, what are like some of the five greatest things you've seen in sports? And I go, well, you know, like I've had, I've been lucky. I've, I've seen Tiger Woods hit a golf ball right in front of me. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, I've, I've saw the Olympic torch being lit in the stadium. And, and I tell them though, one of the five greatest things ever was watching Rick Majerus eat a pizza. What? So we get <laughs> done at, I've done sports center that night. Reese Davis has done the raps on the college basketball. And so we get out early enough, though, because it was still I was doing the 11. We go over to the local. It's now a double tree, I think. But it was we just used to call it the ESPN dorms. It's where they put everybody up. So sure. Reese is there. Digger Phelps is there. Majerus and I stroll in. Now, at 1215, because it's not very far from where we are, uh, you can't get anything in Bristol, Connecticut. There's just nothing to eat. 1215. Forget it. And somehow, here come two pizzas walking through the door. And they're looking for Majerus. And we're like, okay, first off, this is incredible. There are two pizzas. One's cut like a regular pizza. And then there's one cut in quarters. That's Rick's. Oh, my gosh. And the other one's... And I watch Majerus from about... So we get there at 2.15. These pizzas come... uh, 12.15. Pizzas come 12.30, whatever. 
And in seven minutes, it's just elbow and teeth and crust and, <laughs> and gone. And it is still one of the most amazing sporting events, sporting feats I've ever seen. Rick Majerus, God rest his soul, because that's part of the reason he went to an early grave. But Rick Majerus eating a pizza uh, is one of the greatest things I've ever seen in sports. It is wow. right up there with he seeing Tiger Woods hit a golf ball. Okay. Jeez, yeah. that's insane. And, oh, by the way, conjuring, conjuring up the pizzas is something that should not be discounted. Because if you've lived here long enough, you'd know – that in itself was amazing that somehow the man knew the right person to keep the shop open and keep the ovens warm and get him a pizza. A guy like that's got an insider. Let's be real. He's like, got people. He yeah, he's got people, people for things like that. that. Yeah. So oh, there man. it is. Tiger Olympics. I'm not sure. I was at the Lambo leap. I had a lot of good things. Majerus eating a pizza <laughs> will never be bumped out of the top five. Oh man. These are, I don't know. Like, I'm afraid you're going to run out of John Wisconsin stories. I know that there's some that we have in the hopper here that we're going to, I'm going to have to bring back up at some point, but these just never get old, man. And neither does this. I love doing this. This never gets old. Coach was great. We have great episodes coming. We have so many great episodes in the past. Uh, and it's been a blast, man. Let's keep it going. So, Wisconsin, make sure to help us keep it going, right? Subscribe on YouTube. If you're listening on the podcast side, make sure you leave a review. Facebook, Instagram, on all the things. We're on all the things. And we appreciate when you follow us there on all the things. Someday, maybe we'll get John on one of the things. Maybe? Matt, I haven't asked you in a while. I'm just going to say this is, this is the best job I ever had. And leave it at that. Oh, that's nice. All right, here we go. Well, for John, I'm Trevor. Until next time, as you were Wisconsin, we'll see you soon. Remember to subscribe on YouTube, leave a review, smash the like button, just get with us. Inside Wisconsin is brought to you by American Family Insurance, Aaron's Company, Blaine's Farm and Fleet, Capital Credit Union, Festival Foods, Quick Trip, Miller Lite, North Star Mohican Casino Resort, Prevea Health, and the University of Wisconsin Platteville. Sit down. Sit down.